thanks everyone for joining today's webinar on Anesthesia Quality Assurance 101, where we'll go over the function and testing. Uh, we have two speakers today that you'll hear on the other end of the phone line. Uh, myself, Michael Rach. Uh, I'm a senior product manager here at Fluke Biomedical, um, and I've been here for about five years and managed multiple different product lines, uh, such as ProSim, uh, VT, uh, Impulse, and uh, I've also managed the, the entire business at one point. Um, so happy to share my product knowledge with, uh, with you guys on the phone today. And I'm joined here by Mike Wen. Do you care to introduce yourself, Mike? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, as, as Mike mentioned, I'm also a senior product manager here at Fluke Biomedical, and um, I'm now taking over all the product lines that Mike Raish had just uh, previously been uh, managing. And um, yeah, thanks for joining the webinar today. All right, let's get started. So first I wanna cover what we're going to talk about today. Um, and we're gonna go kind of a wide, over a wide breadth of things. So we'll go over the history of anesthesia. We'll talk about how it's delivered. We'll talk about why it should be tested. Uh, and we'll also cover how it should be tested. Um, so lots of interesting topics in store today. Uh, so how about we just jump right in? So I wanna to touch on the history of anesthesia first. Uh, and anesthesia started being used in the early 19th century with Henry Hickman. Uh, and he actually conducted some rather gruesome animal tests. Uh, one thing he did was he would nearly suffocate a dog using carbon dioxide, and then he would amputate a part of its body just to see if it could feel pain. Later, scientists used things like chloroform, uh, diethyl ether, or nitrous oxide versus carbon dioxide. And then as time went on, uh, there's a man named Humphrey Davy. And he was surprised how nitrous oxide made him laugh, which caused him to nickname it laughing gas. Uh, and at the same time, he realized its anesthetic properties. And then as time went on even further, we moved on to inhalational agents. Uh, and mostly this is due to their rapid induction, emergence, and low tissue solubility. And those five inhalational agents that we're talking about today are halothane, enfluorine, isoflurane, sevoflurane, and desflurane. These are all used to varying degrees across the world and in both hospital and veterinary settings. Uh, so over time, inhalational uh, anesthesia has changed quite a bit uh, from carbon dioxide to the agents we use today. But what is anesthesia trying to do? Clinicians administering anesthesia seek to depress the central nervous system. They want to relax the body, decrease metabolism, uh, and reduce respiration and oxygen consumption. Anesthesiologists are looking for the patient, patients to not feel pain, which is called analgesia, not to remember, called amnesia, not to move, which is immobility, to be unconscious, hypnosis, and to be relaxed, which is paralysis. So anesthesia really seeks to do a lot of things um, for the patient so that clinicians can go and do their work, whether it's on the operating table or something else. So we're gonna move on to the first poll question of the day. Um, and we're wondering if you guys know what the AGSS part of the anesthesia system is. Is it the anesthesia gas scavenger system, the all gas supply system, all the alternative ground system shunt? And Mike, that poll question has been launched and we're gonna give um, attendees about 30 seconds to enter your response. So please go ahead and enter your reply because we have a lot of information we would like to share with you today. Absolutely. Yeah, acronyms can be really confusing and it's important to understand what they mean. Um, I know uh, here at Fluke Biomedical, we use quite a bit of them. Uh, so uh, this is always a, a tricky thing for people starting. So let's make sure we understand these uh, acronyms as much as we can. Thanks, Mike. I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll question and share the results. So 88% of the audience um, selected um, anesthesia gas scavenger system. 12% indicated all gas supply system. 
Okay, great. So 88% of you guys are right. It's the anesthesia gas scavenger system. Um, and the purpose of this, and we'll talk about this in some upcoming slides as well, uh, is to remove the anesthesia that's being flowed uh, into the patient, right? Uh, and to make sure that it doesn't flow into the room because this can harm uh, the clinicians, right? That are actually treating the patient, um, but it can also uh, seep into other parts of the hospital as well. Um, so you really wanna contain your anesth anesthetic agent uh, because it can have unintended effects beyond just what you're trying to do with the patient. And that leads us into how anesthesia is delivered. Um, so what is the anesthesia delivery system? Um, there's two main functions of an anesthesia delivery system. One is respiratory support, helping the patient breathe. Uh, and two is agent administration, the inhalational agent in this case. So anesthesia machines need to control, support, or even take over patient breathing while the patient is under anesthesia uh, and the different levels of anesthesia that a patient is put under. The way that the machine does this is through integrating multiple different medical devices into one anesthesia delivery system. To support breathing, there's a switch or a valve and a manual mechanism that the anesthesia clinician uses to manually assist breathing using a breathing bag and an APL, which is an adjustable pressure relief valve. Or this could also be automated uh, and it could be a ventilator uh, on which the anesthesia clinician sets control to assist or control patient breathing. So there's a manual uh, breathing bag mechanism and then there's uh, an automated ventilator mechanism. Uh, so different, different uh, styles here. And then in order to administer agent and anesthetic gases, there's at least one vaporizer. Um, you'll see some setups with one single vaporizer, some with three, um, and all of these are connected to uh, flow meters. And these control fresh gas delivery uh, or carrier gas delivery. Um, the other things you might see on uh, an anesthesia machine is a carbon dioxide absorber. These can be added to the breathing system to scrub out any exhaled carbon dioxide so that the agent rich gases can be reused without having any of the uh, exhaled carbon dioxide in there, um, which can be a, you know, an additional sedative uh, if you think back to our discussion on history. Um, this system is called a circle rebreathing system, and we'll hit on that a little bit more on a future slide. Um, and then the poll question we just had, AGSS. The anesthesia gas scavenging system removes any agent from entering the room, potentially affecting the clinical staff. And then in addition, uh, you'll see in the picture here that there is a uh, patient monitor, right? They're used to monitor the patient's vital signs. Um, so they might be looking at ECG, SpO2, NIBP, and ETCO2. Um, so, you know, your electrocardiogram, your oxygen saturation, non-invasive blood pressure, and end tidal CO2. So really, they're going to look at whatever it takes uh, to understand the patient condition. As you can see just from that brief walkthrough, uh, it's a very complex system, and it's used in a very critical setting uh, as it can either take over patient breath or assist patient breath. So it's really important to understand it, uh, and let's understand it in a little bit more detail. Uh, we'll go into the circle rebreathing system here. So this circle breathing circuit is really something to dig into and understand um, because it is a complex system. Starting at the fresh gas supply, which is in the upper left of this slide, oxygen and air or oxygen and nitrous oxide is applied to the system and flows from the fresh, fresh gas supply all the way through the vaporizer. So in this case, your carrier gases are going to be oxygen, air, or nitrous oxide. Um, when the vaporizer is turned on, agent is then administered into the breathing circuit. And in this case, it's a yellow line flowing outside out of this vaporizer. So for example, sevoflurane, whose international color is yellow, is being administered in this case. Each agent has its own international color code for easy identification. So in this example, we're going to use yellow for sevoflurane. This gas mixture then flows through a one-way valve. And this ensures that the gas can't flow backwards towards the fresh gas outlet or the vaporizer. 
And we'll talk about why that's important in a moment. So from this valve, the combined gases and vapor enters the patient's respiratory system. This is then metabolized and any excess gases or agent are then exhaled along with carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is the gray line. And this is where the one-way valve comes into play. The gas can't travel backward in the circuit and has to flow through the expiratory one-way valve. This ensures that any excess agent and any CO2 that was exhaled is removed from the system so that the next breath from the patient does not rebreathe their CO2. Once it gets past this one-way inspiratory valve, uh, there is a reservoir bag or a ventilator bellows that will be used to deliver the gases and vapor to the patient's lung. And the pressure relief valve is going to ensure that the system and the patient's lungs can't experience an overpressure event. Because again, these patients are sedated. They can't control anything, so the system has to control that for, for them. And then after that, the three gas mixture goes into a carbon dioxide absorber, which will remove the CO2 from the mixture. The absorbent material will turn purple, which indicates that, there, that no more CO2 can be absorbed by that pellet. So over time, you'll see those white pellets turn to purple. And when they're all purple, you'll know that you have to uh, change out your, um, your carbon dioxide absorbent material. And then from here, the system starts over. You scrubbed out your CO2. You have your remaining uh, anesthetic agent, uh, and that fresh gas is then added to that to make up for the amount of gases and vapor uptaken by the patient. And this is where rebreathing re conserves gas and vapor, right? An anesthetic agent, all under the watch of a skillful anesthesia clinician. So this is where the circle concept comes is that the, the patient absorbs the agent, um, and then it gets reused over time uh, and mixed in with fresh gas and fresh uh, agent every time. So the one thing to note is there where the reservoir bag is, is pointed out, that's either, that's where you have the manual uh, method or this reservoir bag can be, uh, you know, uh, replaced by a, a ventilator and it could be more mechanical. The other part of the system that's, uh, we can go into depth on is the vaporizer. Um, so if we get into the inner workings here, what does a vaporizer try and do? It tries to release a controlled amount of anesthetic agent to the patient. There's a knob on the top, which allows for carrier gas, uh, which could be air, oxygen, or nitrous oxide to flow into the vaporizer and carry the agent away. But how does it do that? The majority of vaporizers have wicks that absorb the fluid agent inside the vaporizer. And then the carrier gas takes this vapor with it as it passes through or by the wick. Other vaporizers are pressurized and work more like a fuel injector in a car. Um, so that's a different system than what's displayed here. And the other thing to note is that most vaporizers don't need a heating element. Uh, there is one agent, desflurane, that does require heating because it remains a liquid at room temperature and it needs to be a vapor when it's administered. Um, so you might notice a difference in desflurane vaporizers, which are blue colored since they need that heating element. So here we have the next question and Mike, I think you wanted to take this one on. Yeah, thanks. So to take for the next poll question, why should the gas flow and pressure of the anesthesia system be tested at the fresh gas outlet? Is it one, gases and anesthetic vapor undiluted from anesthesia system? Two, gases and anesthetic vapor plus concentrations exhaled by patient? Or three, it doesn't really matter. And Mike, that poll question has been launched. Once again, we will give um, attendees 30 seconds to enter your reply. And responses are coming in. I think you're going to be really surprised with the results. This is a good question. Good. We'll see how it comes in. Okay, and that poll is closing now. 
and share share the results. Let's see, 56% um, indicated um, one gas and anesthetic vapor undiluted, 43% indicated gas and anesthetic vapor plus concentrations, and 1% indicated it doesn't matter. All right. Well, the answer is the first option, um, that the gases and anesthetic vapor are undiluted and are only from the anesthesia system. If you think about the last slide we were on with the circle rebreathing system, in the top left, right after the gases pass the fresh gas outlet um, and uh, the vaporizer, that's when you're going to want to test it because uh, it's coming. Uh, so you're getting the undiluted uh, agent, which is you want to. You're trying to test the vaporizer at the end of this, right? You're not trying to test the CO2 absorber. You're not trying to test any other part of the uh, vaporizer. You're really trying to focus in on where uh, the the part of the medical device that you're trying to test. So that's why you want to focus on the fresh gas outlet. You don't need any other contaminants or anything else uh, messing with your results. So take those out of the formula. Very helpful. Thanks for that explanation. And so as we've been talking about the inhalation anesthetic agents in the webinar, we talk, wanted to talk more about the actual delivery of it. And so the, the agent is breathed into the lungs. It's then metabolized by the body. And essentially, it results in the intended effects of the anesthesia. Uh, the systems can and do apply pressures, volumes, and flows of gases on a patient's respiratory system and can damage the human body. So before doing any testing or adjustment on an anesthesia delivery system, it is critical that we understand what we're doing and the effects that it can have. So shown here is the ideal gas law, but there's more to understand such as Boyle's law, understanding the role that pressure, volume, and temperature, as well as many other factors play is critical to understand what we're doing and also if what we did had the intended consequences. Yeah, it's critical to think back to uh, high school math uh, or science in this case, right? Because um, we're playing with the human body. Um, and we want to make sure that everything's working the way that it should. Exactly. And and at times it doesn't always go as expected. Um, so it really is important that ventilators be tested to avoid any unintended consequences, such as too little or too much anesthesia. So if too much agent is administered, it can cause cardiac arrest and even death. But under administration of the agent has its own issues as well. Uh, if too little is used, it can cause situations where the patient can still feel the procedure going on, which I think we can all agree is not what anyone wants. Um, in other situations, the patient is awake or aware during the procedure, which they're needed for listening or watching the procedure happen, um, but this can, this can cause psychological effects that the patient may need to live with for the rest of their lives. So it really is critical that we make sure the equipment is working properly and administering the right amount. Uh, this leads us to our next poll question. So why is having more than one anesthetic agent a bad thing? One, because there may be a problem with the vaporizer safety system. Two, may cause an overdose to the patient resulting in injury or death. Three, it may mean an older, less safe anesthesia system is in use. Or four, all of the above. And Mike, that third poll question has been launched and responses are coming in. And for this third poll question, we'll give uh, attendees, let's give you guys um, 40 seconds for this one. 10 seconds per option. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Plenty of time to think. And the votes are here. And okay, let's go ahead and close that poll question and I'll share the results. Okay, let's see. For this um, question, 
7% of the audience said there may be a problem with the vaporizer safety system. 29% indicated it may cause an overdose to the patient resulting in injury or death. And 64% indicated all of the above. Great. Drum roll, please. <laughs> the answer is all of the above. Um, yeah, so all these options can be uh, assigned if uh, more than one agent is being administered. Um, so vaporizers attached to the uh, anesthesia delivery system via an interlock system. Uh, these interlock systems ensure that when one vaporizer is turned on, that the other can't be turned on. So if you ever see uh, two agents being administered at the same time, there can be an, a, a, an error with your interlock system. So that's another thing that you wanna make sure that you are testing uh, and making sure that that's operating the way that it should. If two agents are being administered, what's the effect on the patient? Um, you, you, the way you gotta think about it is, you're probably trying to control the delivery of one agent as an anesthesiologist, and you don't know that this second agent is being administered as well. So you might see uh, effects on a patient um, that drive towards overdose, all the things that Mike talked about in the last slide with over-administration of an agent. Um, and that might cause some questions. Um, and again, the unintended effect there is cardiac arrest or death. You wanna avoid that. Um, and the other thing is, technology has moved pretty far over time. Um, modern uh, anesthesia delivery systems have the interlock system, but older, less safe anesthesia systems like this uh, allow for things you know, to happen that you know, modern safeguards don't allow. Um, so do think about the technology that's used in your system as well, because it can allow for multiple agents to be administered at the same time as well. Um, so yes, all, all the above uh, can be bad things caused by having more than one anesthetic agent uh, administered to a patient at a given time. So do check for them. Yeah, very good point. Thanks for sharing. Uh, so we wanted to take a look at a case study. <clears throat> we know that vaporizer malfunctions do happen. And so let's just take a look at one scenario. So in this, in this situation, we have a 36-year-old uh, woman that underwent surgery for her left arm. Uh, Desflurin vaporizer was set to 3.5% to maintain anesthesia. Um, what happened was after five minutes, the patient became oxygen deficient and displayed an abnormal heart rate and soon followed by a cardiac arrest. The ECG monitor indicated that her heart had stopped an epinephrine injection had an external countershock and it restored circulation. Uh, the patient was then sedated and transferred to the post anesthesia care unit where an X-ray revealed an acclimation, accumulation of fluid in her lungs. So what do you think went wrong here? And um, if we go to the next slide here. So what happened was if, if you know, it's important to really look at the equipment and what they did was they did that and they found that the vaporizer dial was cracked. So initially they had thought they were uh, giving 3.5%. It turned out it was actually 23%. So a much, much higher uh, amount than intended. Um, it's really important to know like failures like this can and do occur. However, they, they really are preventable. Uh, vaporizers themselves, they're very heavy, clunky devices that can drop. And if they are dropped in, in this case, or if it's tipped too far back, the wick can oversaturate. Um, but know that if, if it had been checked before surgery, we could have avoided this situation altogether. So it just further uh, emphasizes the importance of routine maintenance and testing to make sure you know, we keep our patients safety or our patients safe. Absolutely. So why should we test anesthesia machines? Well, the case study is a reminder that things can and do go wrong. The anesthesia delivery system has a lot of parts and routine maintenance can detect component and system failures. So let's remember that they are here to provide respiratory support and deliver agent, but it takes a lot of parts to do that and any one of these can fail. And there are tools that can help you detect the failures. 
So let's talk through how they can improve your testing. Yeah, so let's go through a couple best practices here um, to make sure we can best detect these failures, um, hopefully before the medical device is used. Um, but the more, the better the system you put in place, the better the results you're gonna get out of it. Um, and one of the big parts of that system is to adopt a procedure. Um, when you adopt a procedure, make sure you record your results and that you track your results. Uh, the best way uh, is to lock in a process and ensure that everyone is adhering to that same process uh, through using workflow automation software. Um, but this procedure that you're gonna lock in should follow the OEM service manual or your local, national, or international standards. And this ensures that your testing is both complete and compliant. Next, after you lock in your procedure, you have to follow that procedure. Um, so ensure that all the steps are carried out, that all the results are, document, are documented <laughs> and uh, trends are tracked. Um, it's really important to have a process and follow it. And it, it's really important that this is done across the organization, right? Not that one person is doing it one way and another's uh, doing it another. Uh, consistency and standardization is key here. Um, and the last thing is, don't change that procedure often. Stick with a common procedure. And if you do choose to change it over time, document what was changed and why you chose to change it. Uh, when an auditor comes in house, it goes a long way in defending your decision to change your procedure. The next thing after you have a procedure that you're following, is determining your test frequency. How often will you follow that procedure? This should be found in your service manual, but many times service manuals don't, uh, don't note it. Or if you can't find your service manual, uh, another way to think about it uh, is using a risk-based approach. Uh, and this is an example here on the screen. So what this does is it takes a few things uh, into consideration. So one is the criticality of the, med the medical device. Right. The second is the risk that a failure might have. Uh, the third is the probability of a failure in your own hospital's experience with the medical device. And then it also takes into consideration the industry's experience with that medical device as well. Uh, so in this example here, uh, you know, it says that the device is used for life support. So it gets a five there. Uh, it could result in severe injury and or death. Um, that a common device failure is predictable and can be avoided by preventive maintenance, to Mike's point on the last slide, um, that there's a significant history of uh, incidents that exist, uh, and that there are requirements for testing independent of a numerical rating system. So as we look at all of that and add those up, it comes to a score of 17. Um, and a score of 17 is above the threshold of 13, which means that we require semi-annual testing. So twice a year service is recommended for ventilators uh, since they are critical life support devices and that failure could result in death. So if, if it could result in death and you can prevent it, we should prevent it. Um, so again, if you can't find a test frequency in your service manual, do use something like this um, to help you break down and figure out um, what your test frequency should be. The other thing is we talked about the system. The anesthesia delivery system isn't just um, an anesthesia machine per se, right? So do one test that covers the whole medical device or asset. And, and this goes for all your medical devices in the facility, but we'll break down a, an anesthesia delivery system here. Um, it's complex. It has a patient monitor, a ventilator, a vaporizer, and it runs off uh, mains power. So that means to do the testing, you'll need a gas flow analyzer for the ventilator, a multi-gas analyzer for the vaporizer, an electrical safety analyzer since it runs off mains, and a patient simulator since you have a patient monitor built in. All of this to verify the performance and safety of the entire medical device. Um, the list of tools likely contains even more accessories and PM kits that you'll need to complete the job. Um, but these are the, the basic biomed tools that you need to get the job done. So make sure that you do it all at one time 
and you link those results back all the way to the asset number. So that asset number does contain all of these pieces of equipment. So do it all at once. Keep all the information together. We talked about the tools, but it's really important to choose the right tool. Um, and there's a list of questions that you should ask yourself before purchasing a gas flow analyzer and or a multi-gas analyzer, as those are the tools that are most specific to the anesthesia delivery system. You might want to ask yourself if it does all the testing required. Think about your ranges, your accuracies, right? Um, where do you do the testing? Do you have enough space? Is your analyzer large or small? Um, do you need to move with your analyzer? Is it heavy? Um, can you automate it? Everyone has a lot of uh, medical devices that they need to perform testing on every year. Can you do it faster? Can you do it more standardized, right? Um, do you travel? Do you need it to be portable? Similar to the points I made earlier, size, weight can all be a factor. Um, do you need to plug it in? How many times have you done a preventive maintenance and you couldn't find an outlet nearby? So is your device battery powered? Can you unplug it from a wall and perform your testing um, if you're in one of those situations? And is it easy to use? We have people coming into the industry all the time. Is it easy to onboard someone and teach them how to use it? Um, this could be the button pushing on the screen, uh, but this could also be uh, the transfer of knowledge. And if you use a workflow automation software, is it easier to get them started on that to say, here is what you do. Here are the pictures, here's the procedure. These are all great questions, right? But to make sure you pick the tool that's right for you and the right for your job is, is paramount because there are requirements here. And at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to ensure patient safety and not just patient safety, but operator safety. So our final poll question here uh, is on the screen now. Uh, when should a certified test lung be used? When you're testing the anesthesia system ventilator, when doing any testing of the anesthesia system, or when testing the output of the anesthesia system table before the breathing circuit? And that last poll question has been launched. And once again, we thank all of you for participating in the poll questions. This is very helpful for us as it allows us to use your feedback with developing new webinars and also addressing your questions and concerns throughout uh, this session. And so we're gonna give participants another, let's give them 15 seconds to enter their reply and I'll close the poll. Okay, and the poll is closing now. I'll share those results. Now let's see, 53% indicated A, when testing the anesthesia system ventilator, 36% um, indicated B, when doing any testing of the anesthesia system, and 11% indicated testing output anesthesia system before um, breathing circuit. Great, yeah, so the answer is the first option. Um, you should use a certified test lung when you're testing the anesthesia system ventilator. Um, and the, the reason for this is uh, the certified test lung is basically simulating a healthy adult lung. Uh, and the only time that you're using a certified test lung is when you are testing uh, breath parameters. So when you're... Um, Think about the 16 parameters you can see on the front of our VT, for example. Um, when the breath is going, is bi-directional, right? Coming into the gas flow analyzer and then back out, that's when you need that lung and you're only using it for ventilator testing. Vaporizer testing, on the other hand, is steady state flow, right? So what you're trying to figure out is what's the concentration of that agent in that flow uh, at any given flow rate. Um, so that's more steady state. So think about it as bi-directional breaths is when you use a lung, um, and then steady state flow is when you would use your uh, multi-gas analyzer. The, the term certified test lung is important to hit on too, 
Um, Cause we kind of talked about test loans in general, but why would you want a certified one? Uh, like our, the example we have is the Aculum 2 or the Aculum. Um, you want to make sure that your results are traceable and repeatable. Um, so you want to make sure that you have specifications that are stated for your lung, whether it's uh, compliance or resistance. Um, you want to make sure that you're using something that's going to you know, tie back to repeatable, consistent results that you can trust. Um, and that's why you want to make sure you're looking out for a certified test lung um, and not just uh, a balloon that uh, could basically, you know, inflate and deflate at um, any rate. You want something that has specifications that you can point back to. And again, put that accessory back into your test procedure, right? Make sure it's documented what tool to use so that you can really be sure that the test results are the same every time. So to that end, pick the right technology. Um, uh, IR, so infrared photo spectrometry, right, is the technology used by most multi-gas analyzers. Um, and there's two types. Uh, one is dispersive. This is technology that uses a prism. And then there's a non-dispersive version, which uses optical filters. So when you're looking for, oh, when you're looking for a test device, um, make sure you're using the most up-to-date technology uh, with NDIR, so the non-dispersive uh, infrared photospectrometry, uh, to ensure that you have the most accurate gas detection. Uh, the image shown is a little bit busy, but the main takeaway from all this is that the wavelengths are really close together for each one of those agents, and they can be really hard to detect. So use the best technology, um, and it will give you the best results. The other thing is, um, in these uh, multi-gas analyzers, uh, a, lo a lot of times you're asking it to look for a certain agent. Um, do look for an analyzer that tells you what it sees. So you don't have to look just for sevoplurane. You can say uh, to your multi-gas analyzer, what do you see? And it might pick up two agents at the same time. Um, so again, going back to why that was important, um, it is, it, it, these are all very important questions to ask yourself as you're looking for your next analyzer. The other thing is uncertainty. Um, if you think back to metrology, um, it's all about getting the most accurate results and the most repeatable results. Um, so consider the total uncertainty of your system. Uh, many biomeds might be using calibrated gas to conduct routine maintenance on the multiple gas monitor um, and, and then using that multiple gas monitor to verify the vaporizer, uh, which is kind of uh, what's shown here on the left. Calibrated gas can be used to test the multiple gas monitor or the respiratory gas monitor, uh, also known as an RGM. Um, and then in each one of those calibrated gas containers is marked with a specific percentage of each gas. So there's a mixture inside of it. Um, and which vapor it contains. So that process works well for the calibrated gas bottle and the respiratory gas monitor, um, and that's fine. But the multiple gas monitor on an anesthesia system isn't sufficiently accurate to measure the vaporizer efficacy and calibration. So if you were to take that respiratory gas monitor and then measure your uh, vaporizer, you're adding uncertainties. Calibrated gas has an uncertainty, which was your X, and the respiratory gas monitor has its own uncertainty, which is your Y. So your total uncertainty could end up being X plus Y. The uncertainty of the calibrated gas plus the uncertainty of the respiratory gas monitor. Having fewer items in your uncertainty budget will help you lower your overall uncertainty. Uh, calibrated gas can be used to test that uh, respiratory gas monitor, but it should really stop there. You should really use a third party piece of test equipment to test your vaporizers and not your respiratory gas monitor. This will provide the most accurate results and prevents you from testing a brand X vaporizer with a brand X respiratory gas monitor, which can often happen. So remember that the goal here is accuracy and the output here is patient and operator safety. So do minimize the things in your uncertainty change. Do use a third party test device for your vaporizers. Um, you can continue to use 
uh, calibrated gas for your respiratory gas monitors. So one thing that um, we kind of want to close with is when we develop a new piece of hardware, we start all the way back to the customer, right? And what is their job to be done? And we know that you guys need to test the ventilator. You guys need to test the vaporizer. Um, both of those need to be tested for minimum performance and safety. On top of that, you know, you have your uh, patient monitor built in. Uh, you have electrical safety you need to do, right? All of this requires a specific test setup, tools, and a procedure. Um, you also have to find your medical device to test. Um, this is a lot easier to do with an anesthesia machine than, say, an infusion pump. Um, but nevertheless, it's still a step in the process. Uh, and then you typically have a system uh, or a CMMS, which will help you open and close your work orders. So as we went through and developed our products, you know, we listened to all your feedback and, you know, we made sure to allow uh, that our, allow our analyzers to be all day on the go testers of medical gas flow equipment. You know, we, we know that a single solution was needed, right? With no modules, with a short warm up time and improved portability. Vapor, our multi-gas monitor, is a solution with automatic agent detection. So it tells you what it sees, not what you told it to look for. Um, and it can also detect two agents at the same time. So this is a solution that also tests that interlock system that we touched on earlier. On top of all that, you can automate your testing uh, with the VT, with our ProSim 8, um, and our ESAs into one standardized automated test procedure which can be completed with pictures of your test setup, um, any specific tasks or questions that your facility requires. Um, and just to top it all off, you could integrate that with your CMS provider to be able to open and close work orders. Um, so overall, we have an end-to-end -end solution uh, for anesthesia uh, delivery system testing that I think is really compelling to take a look at. Um, so I'd urge you to, you know, understand that it takes a lot to test an anesthesia machine, um, but do dig into some of these things to understand how you could possibly make it easier for yourself or your facility. So with that, we're gonna turn it over to any questions uh, you guys on the phone might have. Yeah, thanks, and again, Mike. thank you for all your attention. Absolutely. We do have a, a couple questions that have come in so far. Uh, the first question that has come in is, is it mandatory to check electrical safety before calibration? So uh, electrical safety testing uh, is a, a requirement. So again, always look, refer back to, to the service manual. Um, but one thing I would urge you to, to consider is the fact that electrical safety testing should be done first um, because if your device is not uh, electrically sound, we'll say, um, it could throw off any of your performance testing readings, right? When you're doing your uh, patient simulation testing uh, or your gas flow analyzer testing. Um, so it is fundamental. Um, it does, failures do still occur. Um, I understand that there's, there are pushes for less and less uh, electrical safety testing. Um, but again, if you, automate this, if you build it into your procedure, um, you can still do this and save time. Um, so do, do consider workflow automation to make sure that you can do everything that you need to do um, in either the same amount of time uh, or faster. So do look into that. Great. Uh, we have a question that, that goes back to one of the slides referring to the case study and the the reader wants to know, uh, are we recommending biomets check the machines before each patient? So this is up to your, your facility, right? Um, your facility is going to determine uh, what frequency you want to, to follow. Um, and in my example, you know, we talked about testing this semi-annually. Um, but again, there's, there's nothing that's going to, to hold you back from testing more frequently. Um, we're not saying test between every patient, although that would be uh, best case. Um, that example was just to illustrate that, you know, if if preventive maintenance had been done uh, before that case, um, or or think about it this way, um, that that technician 
likely dropped the vaporizer or tipped it over. Um, somebody knows that that happened, right? So anytime there's an incident, you should really be look, going back to that medical device and questioning if it's still safe to use um, or performing the way that it should. Um, so again, it, it's, it's all about the, the culture. Well, one is the, the procedures at your organization, but also the culture of your organization, right? Um, if something happened, just, just make sure that everything's working the way that it should. Okay, another question. What's the difference between auxiliary common gas outlet and fresh gas outlet? Um, there are a lot of terms depending on brand and model um, of different uh, anesthesia delivery system. Um, and you know, a lot of times it, they're, they're very much the same. Uh, but really what you're, for those on the phone, you know, regardless of the term, what you're trying to look for is the source of the gas that would flow to the patient, right? Um, you want to take out any of those contaminants or things that could uh, change your, your readings. You want to take this, the system out of it, right? And really figure out if your, your vaporizer is, is working the way that it should. That's going to give you the best reading. It's also going to give you the fastest reading. Um, a lot of times when you go to uh, an OEM uh, training, right, to learn how to do preventive maintenance uh, on these devices will give you um, some proprietary fittings that will allow you to do testing from specific spots. Um, so do look out for those. Um, do share pra best practices throughout your organization. But again, that will give you the cleanest reading and, and honestly the fastest reading. Okay, great. We're, uh, we've just got two more questions that just came in. What's the acceptable range when testing the vaporizer with the VT900? So there's a lot of different ranges and accuracies when it comes to our, our gas flow analyzers. And Mike, was that the question about vaporizers? Yes. Okay, so yeah, so the, the unit that we sell that actually tests the vaporizer um, is uh, the vapor anesthesia tester. Um, so this is something that uh, you can plug into your VT900A, uh, and then it becomes your complete uh, anesthesia delivery system uh, test solution. Um, so in terms of, of range, we offer full range for the five agents. Um, so you'll be able to test your highest test point plus uh, your largest tolerance. Um, and that's going to allow you to find your, uh, your failures even at the high end. Um, and that's something that was... Uh, rolled out recently. So if you do own a vapor and you haven't uh, updated to the, the latest firmware, make sure you do that. Um, it unlocks some some new features uh, even within the last year. Um, so do do unlock the, the most that you can. Um, but no, it's full it's full range for the five agents. Um, it also tests uh, CO2 and N2O. And again, it displays uh, two agents on the screen. You'll always see the uh, concentration of CO2 and N2O as well. Um, so it does tell you what it sees, auto detection, uh, displays the international color code, um, and it also um, uh, allows for two agents to be displayed on the screen at the same time. So you can detect those interlock failures, not just the, the single vaporizer, but the system. Okay, uh, I think we have time for one more. And uh, it says, we see the modern anesthesia has NMT and BIS monitoring. Can you talk briefly about that? Yeah, so uh, biz monitoring and, and things of that nature, we're, we're constantly out there in the field right now. Uh, and in, basically for those on the phone, these are all um, different technologies to measure the patient. Um, and in this case, it's, it's kind of their brain activity um, while they're under anesthesia. So um, the clinicians are constantly looking for ways to, uh, you know, be less and less invasive. Um, and people don't want to, like, uh, to Mike's slide, over-administer agent or under-administer agent. So what they're looking to do is measure uh, brain activity to make sure that the patient is far enough sedated, right, but not over-sedated. Um, and that they're looking for that sweet spot. So that's what these technologies um, seek to, to detect um, to prevent any of those over 
and under administrations of, of anesthetic agents. Um, so you might see those built in as well. Um, those are things that we, we do preventive maintenance on. Um, but yeah, additional technologies to keep us, uh, the patients safe. Great, I think we have time for one more. Um, and that was how does Fluke test equipment export test information to be added to work tickets? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, there, there are a couple different options. Um, so uh, if someone were to be using uh, just one of our uh, gas flow analyzers, either the VT650 or the VT900A, um, what they could do is do their testing uh, on the go, right? Uh, with their battery powered unit, save it to the device. Um, and what they can do at the end of the day is, is come back to your, your workstation uh, and you can pull that off with uh, an Excel add-in. So you can take all the data on your device, pull it into Excel, um, and you could use that as a data export um, and put, push it into your work order. Um, that's the manual option. Um, the other option that you have uh, as a Fluke by Metal customer is to look into uh, one QA workflow automation software. Um, and what this will do is plug into your test device. Um, so you'll plug a laptop into your, your VT900A, for example. And what it will do is, is take, it will execute a test procedure that your facility has decided on. Take over control of your VT900A so you don't have to do any button pushing. Um, and it will uh, change the settings. There might be some uh, connection changes, right? As you move from airway flow to say pressure um, or ultra low pressure. Um, but essentially it will direct you what to do. It will execute the test. It will pull the test data off and populate a report for you. And again, this doesn't have to just be a VT report. It can also encompass ESA uh, and ProSim. Um, so you get a complete test report. Uh, and this is where the integration with the CMMS uh, comes into play, um, which is if we, if we have an integration that uh, using your CMMS, uh, what we can do is that work order could originally be opened in your CMMS and there might be a, a and different CMMSs have different uh, visualizations or user interfaces. Um, so, so do reach out to us for your specific CMMS uh, but there could be a button there that says execute one QA. So you've opened your work order as the, the medical device and you're gonna hit one QA and it's gonna show you the exact procedure to use. You plug in your, your test equipment, you go, you get your results and it can even bring your uh, test results right back into your work order. So all you have to do is close it. Um, different levels of integration with different CMMS providers, um, but we do have some videos available um, that we can share, share with you and show you um, what that might look like uh, for your CMMS provider. So a wide range of ways that you can work with uh, exporting your data from the test device to your CMMS. Um, so reach out and we can show you more. That, thanks for sharing that. Uh, and if there are any other questions, please continue to send them in and we will certainly follow up with questions to all the answers following the webinar. Well, thank you. Um, I want to say thanks to Michael Rach and Mike Wen, our speakers today, and all of you, the audience, for participating in today's session.